Welcome to the Resilient Series. I'm Stephanie Weaver, author of the upcoming Migraine Relief Plan Cookbook, which has a theme of resilience. My guest today is Laura Davis. Laura is the author of six best-selling books, including The Courage to Heal, and I Thought We'd Never Speak Again, and she's a writing teacher and facilitator. Her brand new memoir, The Burning Light of Two Stars, is out now. There is a content warning for this interview as we will be talking about childhood sexual abuse. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, thanks for having me. Tell us briefly what your memoir is about. The Burning Light of Two Stars tells the story of my um, embattled relationship with my mother and our um, drive to love each other and this surprising collision course we ended up on at the end of her life. Um, my mother and I had experienced a really terrible rift in my 20s, um, and it led to many years of us not speaking to each other. And then over 20 years, we gradually uh, began to make our way back to each other to try to find a path towards uh, reconciliation. And, you know, I think at that time, um, which was maybe 20 years ago, I would have said we had reconciled. In fact, I held us up as an example. Um, but then my mother got old um, and she was living on the East Coast and I was living 3000 miles away in California, which was no accident. Uh, you know, it had been intentional on my part. I just kept moving further and further away from her. I really needed to establish my own identity as a young person. Um, but now many years had gone by and she calls uh, one day when she's almost 80 years old and announces, doesn't ask, announces, that she's moving across the country to live out the rest of her life in my town. Um, and, you know, suddenly this, I realized that the way my mother and I made peace in part was we had a 3000 mile buffer between us. And suddenly that buffer was gone. Um, she moved across the country and uh, her decline and she, she started developing dementia. Her decline pretty much triggered every button that I had. And, you know, how could it not? She made those buttons. Right. Um, and, and yet I had I had promised to become her caregiver. And so I was facing this dilemma that I think millions of people face is, you know, can you take care of a parent who betrayed you in the past? And was it going to be possible for me to become the daughter she needed me to be? You know, could I actually open my heart and find compassion for this woman who had uh, we had a very difficult past and, and with a lot of betrayal. And so that was the challenge I faced. And that's that's the story I wanted to tell uh, what happened after that. Well, I'm guessing that so many people just pause this recording to go buy your book after hearing what it's about. And if you didn't, feel free to pause it right now and order Laura's book and then come back. Um, so I'm working on a very similar story, a similar memoir. And I had a very difficult relationship with my mother. And when I tell people uh, that I'm working on a book about forgiving a difficult parent who never said they were sorry after they were gone, people always ask, well, when is it out? <laughs> is it out now? And so uh, Laura's book is out now, so you can order her book in the meantime. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's difficult. You know, I, I was so related to so much of your story and I was sitting here nodding as Laura was talking. Um, so you became an internationally known advocate for survivors, and yet behind the scenes, your family was not supportive. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, when I, my mother and I had uh, kind of a difficult relationship all along. And I think as soon as I became like an adolescent, as soon as I began to assert my separateness from her is when our troubles began. And then they just kind of escalated over the years. And then I, I grew up in the 60s and I, uh, and 70s, and I was, you know, I was a hippie kid. And so I made a lot of choices that drove my mother insane. And I think I probably was a, a really difficult daughter. Um, I came out to her as a lesbian when I was 23. And she said, you've confirmed my worst fear about you. <laughs> she was such a, she was a drama queen. And she got over that pretty quickly and became supportive, you know, after maybe three or four years, which felt endless at the time. But she came around like most of the culture did. Um, and then when I was 27, I began to have these memories um, which of having been sexually abused by her father, so my grandfather. And uh, I, I, I just began completely falling apart because it, it felt like this kind of like bolt from the blue, really. But actually, it made so many things in my life make sense. 
like why I had been dysfunctional in relationships, why I was, you know, shut down sexually or only in certain ways, and um, just so many things about the way I had coped um, and the, the, the kind of the limitations I was running up against as a young adult. They, it all made sense. But it was a devastating um, thing to remember. And I, I really wanted my mother's support. And I kind of doubted I was going to get it because of the history of everything that had come before. Um, and when I told her um, that he had abused me, uh, she turned on me, you know, and, um, you know, she basically voted on her dead father over her living daughter. And it was it was such a devastating betrayal. Um, because I, I was at the worst point in my life where I really didn't know if I would make it, if I could possibly heal. And I, all I knew was that I was just experiencing this horrible trauma um, as I was remembering. And I, I just, it was all I was thinking about. It was totally consuming my whole life. This was in my late twenties, early thirties. Um, and, and I didn't have my mother's support. In fact, I had the opposite. Um, so that that created this huge rift. And then I went ahead and with uh, my co-author, Ellen Bass, we wrote the book, The Courage to Heal, which was published in 1988. I was 31 years old. So I was really like a baby now, I would say. I was young. And the book took off beyond any expectations we had. And it became this grassroots bestseller. It became like a talisman for people. They would they would carry it around. They would put it under their pillow. They would have it on their altar. Um, and it was a book that really launched a movement. And I, you know, I just had no way to know that that was going to happen. So the book got lots of press and we were on all kinds of big national TV shows. And I was traveling around on the lecture circuit, like talking about healing um, and, and being like a, an icon for millions of people who wanted to heal from sexual abuse. And it was an awkward position to be in because I was had gotten famous in this little niche for this really bad thing that had happened to me, this terrible thing. And it was to be identified, have my whole life like identified with this thing um, was, was really challenging. But the worst part was that my family abandoned me at that point. Um, everyone on my mother's side of the family stopped speaking to me. Um, and uh, you know, it was a really excruciating time, and I had to I had to create an alternative family. Uh, my father, my parents were divorced. My father was very supportive of me, so I really leaned on him. Um, when I told him, he just said, "I always thought he was a bastard." You know, and that was like the best response right. I ever could have gotten. Yeah. You know, to get that kind of validation. So this is so interesting to me because reading your book, I so related to you but also i was one of those people in the mid 80s and late 80s who um, used your book as a touchstone and a talisman and kind of a bible when i was dealing with my own sexual abuse history and so you know i i when i read that scene where you were going up on stage and you know kind of seen as this icon and you're all dressed up and all these people are kind of looking to you to heal them and help them um but inside maybe you didn't feel that way either and so i just want to thank you and alan bass for writing this book and it, but it was fascinating to hear what that experience was like for you so thank you for sharing that yeah i mean it's it's it, in a way what you're saying is true you know like when i actually was on stage or when i was actually in those positions where I was being public, I really felt like I was given this, like this, this gift of this, this like clarity, um, this compassion, this energy, this, I felt like I was filled with this healing energy that wasn't really mine. Um, mm. You know, I, I do live in California. I, yes. I, I felt like I, I was channeling this thing and I don't usually use language like that, but that is what the experience was like. So it's not like it was fake when it was happening, it was real, but it's just that I couldn't hold on to it. Mm. And at the end of these, uh, because I felt like I was, I was meant to be this messenger. And so I was given the grace and the, the clarity and the open heartedness in those moments to really connect with people. But then afterward I would fall apart and it would yeah. be, it would be like, it would be almost like this cloak that I took off and I sloughed it off when I got off the stage. And then I would just feel like my damaged um, survive herself who was just struggling like everybody else to heal 
Yeah. Um, so, so it's not like it was fake, but it was, it, it wasn't, I would, what I would say was it wasn't integrated. Like mm. I wasn't congruent, like who I was on the inside um, all the way through to the center did not match what I was able to manifest on the outside. And I, I didn't yet have the skills um, or the training to be able to hold the energy of all those people. So it was, it was a, it was a challenge for me. You know, now I'm much more capable of doing that because I've been training myself for decades, you know, to be able to really listen from that deep place and to be able to hold people's experiences and, um, and not take them on or take them in. I was sitting here nodding again. I know y'all can't see me when Laura's talking. Um, you know, I ended up not speaking to my parents for 13 years. And yet you corresponded with your mother throughout this whole time period and you kept writing letters. And so for people who have difficult or painful relationships with their family members, what did that correspondence mean or represent to you? I think the first thing I want to say is that there are, and I think this is really important since I wrote a book about reconciling with my mother, you know, making peace with her to the point that I could care for her at the end of her life. I, I think it's really important to say that that is not a path for everyone, um, especially because I feel like I'm speaking to people who were people who benefited from the courage to heal and some people who had incredibly toxic uh, parents or family members. And that there are some times that just setting a boundary and holding it is the most important thing you could do. And there are some uh, relationships that are irredeemable, at least in person, you know, where it's just, it would not be a wise choice and uh, it would just be repeating the same pattern of abuse. So, um, but I, you know, I would have said that about me and then things changed. So it's sort of, you never know what's gonna happen. There was, there was one woman I interviewed and she, um, she had been violently abused by her parents. They were out, both alcoholics, uh, sexually abused and otherwise, uh, really horrendous stuff. And then when her children were born, um, they did the same to her children, to their grandchildren. And so she, she said she was absolutely clear she was never going to see these people again. You know, there, there was just no way that would ever happen. But she said she did enough healing herself that what she said, I had to close the door, but I left the porch light on. And I, I just was so touched by that because I think what she, what she meant to say was that she was never going to have a relationship with them directly, but that on the inside, she actually was able to feel compassion for them and to realize what, what had formed them to become the kind of empty people who would be able to perpetrate those kind of abuse on a child. And that she, she got to a point after many years, this was not at the beginning, um, of feeling compassion for them and, and actually wishing them well from a distance. So I think, you know, I think that's possible, but it's certainly, it is definitely not something to strive for, uh, especially at the beginning of someone's healing process. And, I, I, you know, for, for anyone who is uh, watching today, who is at the beginning of dealing with the trauma in their life, this kind of question of reconciliation or long-term relationships or is for something for like way, 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 way down the road. You know, this is not, in the beginning, what you need to do is take care of yourself and set boundaries. And so I just, I feel like that's so essential to say, because um, I don't want anyone watching this to say, well, Laura Davis said, we have to make peace with our family. <laughs> you know, it, I'm just telling the story of what happened to me. And it may be appropriate for some people. Um, and, you know, sometimes I hope I'm reaching a lot of people where the the breach was not as severe. You know, I mean, there it could, sometimes it's a, a smaller thing that, that, tears people apart and then it just festers um, and then people are not speaking to each other and there's there's so much division in our country right now um, and and I hope that some of the things that my mother and I did will be useful for people dealing with all kinds of different estrangements not just because of sexual abuse you know or something severely traumatic but just really strong differences of opinion you know how do you how do you navigate that why do you think now, looking back, that you and your mother kept persisting and trying to heal your relationship? What's your take on, on it now with that perspective? Well, this goes back to the letters. I didn't really answer that question, but you know, I, the way I describe it is we were two souls who could not quit each other. And I, I felt like there was this, almost like a karmic bond between us. Like there was, there was something where both of us, even though we were, so bitterly angry and disappointed in each other um, 
kept wanting to reach out. And even, even at the worst time between the two of us, we were writing these letters and I, I had kind of forgotten that, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I had my storyline, which is my mother and I did not speak for seven years. And then after she died, um, I found these letters in her things. And there, there were um, all the letters I had ever sent to her. And there were a lot of them. There were all the letters she had ever sent to me, which she had copied. And then there were even first drafts of letters she never sent, you know, uncensored first letters. And so, and I had kept all the correspondence as well. And so when I put it together, there was this really fat binder of letters and it was kind of mind blowing because it, it, it broke down my storyline about my mother. And I, I, that's when I realized we actually had never stopped communicating. Mm -hmm. I, and, you know, letters are, you know, this was before the internet, this was before email. And, and I think we've lost the art of writing letters, but they're, they're beautiful letters. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm a writer, but my mother was a really good writer also and very expressive. And some of the letters are like raging and angry and accusatory. And those were the ones I remembered. And those were the ones where it's like, you know, like, see what she said to me? Um, but when I went back and saw the letters, I saw that there were also letters that were loving and kind and generous and full of good advice and that I was seeking her advice about things, even during this time. I mean, I, that was so mind blowing to me. And what I had to face, which was really challenging, was that I had developed um, a story about my mother, you know, and it was like a story that was like, it was set in stone. And, and it just, she was the villain um, and I was the victim and she had wronged me in all these ways. And it's like all the negative things she did, which there were many, and, and some of them were quite severe, they were set in stone. And the good things, the positive things about her, I just like, I just didn't remember them. And so when I was only part of the truth, but it wasn't the whole truth. And so that, that really set me on a whole complicated, um, exploration of, you know, what was this relationship and what did it mean? And, um, you know, I think, I think there were, uh, there was just like a, a, an inseparable bond between us, you know, something that couldn't be broken. And, uh, it kept, it kept me bound to her from the day of my birth to the day of her death. And I mean, I still, I feel like my relationship, she's been dead seven years. I feel like my relationship with her is still evolving. And I, I've actually talked to people who say that sometimes they're able to actually feel closer to a parent after they die because they're safe. You know, the danger that was there is not there and they could sort of really work things out and, and the relationship keeps growing on the part of the person who's alive. I mean, I don't know if it keeps growing on the person or the, I don't know that, but for the person who's still here, it's possible to continue to make peace. And I think, I think the main thing I want to say is that making peace does not mean becoming a doormat, you know, or sacrificing yourself or putting yourself in a dangerous situation, or even having a direct relationship with the other person, you can still make peace with someone in a lot of different ways, like a lot of different types of reconciliation, more than just like, you know, the violins are playing and there's this Hallmark card scene. There's, there's a lot of other levels. Um, you know, for a long time, my mother and I, we agreed to disagree. That was one of the things we did along the way was we were never going to, I was never going to get what I wanted from her around the incest. Um, and she wasn't going to get what she wanted, which was for me to recant. And, and it was like fighting about that. I'm right. You're wrong. was just such a dead end. And I got to a point in my own healing where I didn't really need her validation anymore. I was, I knew what had happened to me. I had told the whole world about it. I was moving on to other parts of my life and whether my mother, I mean, yes, I still, there was a little part of me that longed for her validation, but it really wasn't that important to the adult self anyway. Um, and so I, we started focusing on things that we still had in common um, so that we could start having some new experiences together, like little things like uh, we love, both love movies. We would go to the movies. We would go to the theater together. Um, and when when I had uh, my son Eli, who's now 28, um, she began coming for a couple months in the winter to my town. She didn't live with me. She'd get her own apartment, and she would have all her own activities. But she put herself in proximity to us for a couple months a year, 
and that was I, I was very uh, ambivalent when she told me she was going to do that. You know, I didn't welcome her at all at first. But those, I really give her a lot of credit that that spending time together, creating new experiences, helped. It like shifted the balance from like the past being the main thing. We started creating some new positive experiences in the present. And, That's great. Know, I think that 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 enabled me to say yes when she wanted to come at the end of her life, even though her decline just triggered me in every possible way. So tell us about the title, The Burning Light of Two Stars. I kind of imagined that you and your mother were stars kind of circling each other or both on fire or in flames or something. And I, I was just really curious uh, about that connection and, and what the title meant to you. It's actually a really good story because this book had a different title up until uh, six months ago. It had already, the decision had been made. I got an email from this, um, this woman um, who had actually, um, she was a former student, writing student of mine, and she had been a visiting nurse and she had been my mother's nurse. So she actually knew my mother um, and she wrote me and she said, what about the burning light of two stars? <laughs> and I, I sent it off to the publisher and they said, that's the title. And I, you know, at first I was, it took me a while to let go of the old title and take on the new one, but it totally has grown on me. And I think it's actually the perfect title. And I like having a title that's not so on the nose. And it's like, what is this book about? And, you know, my mother and I are the two stars, these two very intense personalities that were just like, you know, we were, we were destined to be like this, you know, um, and it, you know, it makes for good reading because there's a lot of conflict. So um, what did becoming your mother's caregiver now that everybody is watching or listening knows how difficult the relationship was, what was did, did becoming her caregiver teach you about resilience? <sighs> wow. It taught me that to be resilient, you need support. I, I think that's the, the number one thing that I, I pulled, I, I'm a networker, you know, um, and I, I, I am part of a lot of groups and things. And so I, you know, uh, my mother and I joined, uh, I joined and pulled my mother along to join a, a support group that was sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association called the Early Stage Memory Loss Support Group. And I think these, there's chapters of this all over the country. Um, and that group was a lifesaver. Every Tuesday we would go and we would, everybody would meet together. And then the people with memory loss would go off in one room with one facilitator and those of us who were caregivers would go in another room with a different facilitator and we would have an hour, an hour and a half to just really get down and talk. So I think that was one thing about being resilient is um, finding support and and getting um, being with other people who are dealing with the same issue for me has always been something I've done my whole life. You know, when I was dealing with incest, I was. Uh, you know, I joined an incest survivor support group. And when I had cancer, I, after I had cancer, I joined like a post-treatment support group. And when my father died, I went to hospice to a grief group. And, you know, I mean, I just, I'm, I, I lead groups for a living. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a believer in, in group support. So, and I also got into therapy. I, I, when my, I was taking care of my mother, I had to get back into therapy because so much was coming up and I was being triggered so much of the time. And I was starting to act out, you know, I was starting to, I wanted to be a good daughter, a mature daughter. I wanted to do what was right. And, and, but these, these old memories and feelings were pushing up and I was losing it. So I, I just like got myself into therapy immediately. So I think those things were really important. Um, you know, I have a spouse who was super supportive um, and she, she just, she always encouraged me to find more compassion uh, and, and less blame. So I'm, I'm really grateful to her because she, she helped me move over kind of my historical impediments that were like these boulders that I couldn't get past of resentment and, you know, I'm right and you're wrong and this is what you did to me. And, and it's like, I was actually dealing with a different mother and anyone who's dealt with someone with dementia, like you're not with the same person. It's not the same mother. And it was both, it was positive in some ways because she, she would say things to me like, you're the best daughter in the whole world, you know, 
or she'd say, you and Karen have done such a great job with those kids. Who says lesbians shouldn't have children? <laughs> she would, these were like two of her little um, tapes that would go. And she, every time I'd see her, she'd say these things multiple times. And, and she would talk about how she loved her grandchildren, you know, our kids. And I, it just, she turned sweet uh, for a period of time. And I suddenly had the kind of loving mother without those like jabs and, you know, all the other stuff coming towards me because that's not who she was anymore. And she just as easily could have turned much more bitter, much more hostile, much more difficult. And I mean, there were plenty of difficult moments, but I feel like I got lucky that way. Um, but still, I, I was, I, I felt like I could start to relax around her for the first time in my whole life. Like she felt safe when she was no longer there. And I, I mean, that's, it, it's painful to say that, you know, but, but that was the reality. And then sometimes, you know, with dementia, it's like, it's like tuning into a radio station and sometimes there's reception and sometimes there isn't. And sometimes I would go to see her and she would be lucid as hell. And I would just be like, whoa, we're going to actually be able to have a real conversation today. You know, and so it was, it was a lot of change all the time. And it was also a lot of, uh, I was grieving for her those all those years that I was taking care of her because, I mean, I knew she was going to die. I didn't know when. And, and but more than that, I, she was losing her faculties and yes. just watching someone decline little by little by little by little is, is it's a grieving process. So you're like pre grieving the person. And so I had a lot of that happening. And I also, you know, I had two teenagers at home at the time. Um, I had a relationship. I was running a, bis a self-employed business person, you know, running a teaching business. And I was just, you know, I was just like, I felt like I was just like in this vice grip, you know, that was just really, really hard. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I go out in nature. I, I live in Santa Cruz, California. There's so much beauty. I live near the beach. I would go down to the ocean. I would go walk in the woods. I would get my feet on the ground. So nature really helped me. Um, you know, seeing friends when I could help me. Uh, I, you know, just figuring out. I've lived long enough that I know the things that really feed me and help me get out of myself. And and I would get body work sometimes just to like help me get in my body. Well, my last question is uh, for people to tell me what their resilience strategies and self care are, and you just answered that. So thank you so much, Laura, for being here today and sharing your story. Please visit lauradavis.net to learn more about her work, and you can find The Burning Light of Two Stars wherever books are sold. You can also read the first five chapters for free at lauradavis.net slash chapters. Check out other episodes of the Resilience series on Facebook Watch, IGTV, and YouTube. Follow me at sweavermph to learn more about my upcoming book, The Migraine Relief Plan Cookbook, which is out in summer of 2022.